the seminar, everyone. We are very happy to have all the way from the Alfred Rennie Institute of Mathematics in Budapest, Balash Patkosh, and he'll be talking to us today about QRE generalizations of set intersection and extremal graph theoretic properties. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, and thank you for coming. It's uh, my first time here. Um, okay, so all I I'm going to talk about today is joint work with my colleagues at the Rennie Institute, Joel Tuza and Matt Wiese. Um, yeah, the title is long and you will see what it tries to cover. Okay, so I think just to be on the safe side, notations, that bracket thing denotes the set of the first and positive integers, power set is denoted in this 2 to the x phase, and uh, the subset or the family of all S element subsets of a set X is denoted by that binomial looking thing. Okay, and then intersection theorems were mentioned in the title, so this is what it is. So we call a family of sets intersecting. If we take any two of the sets in the family, then they should have a non empty intersection. And then uh, the question is that how large. Uh, a family can be if we only try to gather R element subsets of the underlying set with having this property that any pair of sets have a non-empty non intersection from the family. Okay, and the basic result of Erdős Cohen from 1961 says that if n, the size of the underlying set, is large enough, so at least two times the, uh, the, the size of the sets that we are about to gather, uh, then the best we can do is uh, on this picture uh, that what we could do is to take our favorite element of the ground set, say x, and then consider all the R sets that contain this particular element. Then clearly every pair of sets will intersect because of x. Maybe there will be some other intersection elements, maybe not, but definitely x will be there. And this has this family has size n minus 1 choose r minus 1, and the theorem states that you cannot do any better. And actually, if n is strictly larger than 2r, then this is the only way how you can achieve this, this size. Of course, x can vary, but so the stars, the so-called stars, are the only families, only intersecting families that achieve uh, this bound. Okay? And there is another there was another statement in the in the paper of Erdős Quandredo. So we can be interested, or we can uh, increase the uh, or strong, uh, strengthen the, the the intersection property if we want that any two sets from our family should share at least t elements. Then we say that they form a t intersecting family. So this is the t intersecting property, and of course there is a very similar construction. Instead of just fixing one element of the brace set, you can now fix t of them and consider all R sets that contain all of these, then again, trivially, they will uh, form an T-intersecting family. And then the Cohen and Rado, they also proved, uh, this time they couldn't prove the exact uh, threshold that uh, what, how large the ground set should be, so that the statement holds that this trivially T-intersecting family is largest, but they proved that if n is large enough, so the size of the ground set is large enough, then this trivially intersecting family is the largest possible that we can get. And later on, Frankl and Wilson, they determined, so in the, so the Erdős Corrado theorem that's in 61, at, at least when it appeared, then early 80s when Frankl and Wilson uh, determined the threshold for n naught, so for how large uh, n should be so that the trivially intersecting families um, should be the largest one, and then whatever happens below, that had a complete solution in 97 by Rudolf Asvid and Levon Hatsatrian. Okay, so this is what we want to generalize. So how, so and what, so, and, uh, so what will be our object. So I would like to have something, or say something about intersection for integer sequences or vectors. And uh, the way how we go from sets to vectors is character, taking characteristic, characteristic vectors. So for example, if we have the set 1, 2, 5, 7, and we consider the underlying set to be the first eight integers, then of course 
so then what we do is that we introduce a vector of length eight because there are eight possible elements and for each element we, we say with the one that it's there in our set and with the zero that it's not there so for this particular uh, set it's going to be one one zero one zero one zero because yeah so the first two uh, entries should be one because one and two are there the fifth one should be one again because five was there and the seventh one again and in general so that's the, the official rule that uh, the characteristic vector of f has entry one in the ith coordinate if i belongs to the set f okay and why is it good well if you see a linear algebraic proof of, about intersection theorem, then you can see many, then it is very often used that uh, the, in, the size of the intersection of f and g is just the scalar product of the two uh, uh, characteristic vectors. And actually, so there are generalizations of, so, so we, can, we could keep this intersection size for, for any kind of integer sequences and actually there are some results I think by Franco and Kupowski and maybe some others when it's not only 0, 1 vectors like for characteristic vectors but instead minus 1, 0 and 1 are, uh, can be the entries but for me today it will be different so all what matters is that how many entries are there where both entries are, how many indices are there where both entries are one. So I could write that, okay, the intersection size is just the number of indices where the two entries are both one. So that is, they add up to at least two. Okay. Um, and therefore, so if I take that, then I can introduce this definition so I will so my objects will be vectors of length n where instead of just having 0 and 1 entries as possibilities I will have from 0 through q and I will say so I'm interested in s sum intersection so instead of saying that the sum that I, I will count the number of indices where the entries sum up to at least some threshold s so if you take q equals 1 and s equals 2, then you get back the original set intersection. Okay. So, if I have this, if, uh, uh, this definition, then of course I can define my properties. Have any kind of intersection problems, where, which is about uh, pairwise intersection sizes, now I can translate to this setting, because I can say that, oh, sorry, here's a, uh, an example so there are two vectors um, and their five sum intersection has size 3 because you can find the second the third and the last coordinate that sum up to at least five but if I increase the threshold some threshold to six then it's only the third coordinate that satisfies it so the size of the five sum five sum intersection is three but the size of the six sum intersection is one um, okay and now I can say that the family of vectors is S sum T intersecting if for any pair of vectors from my family there, are at, there, there exists at least S indices such that there the entries, uh, sorry, at least T of them such that the, the entries sum up to S. Okay? Uh, and the question is that how many I can get? And since Erdős Koroido was about uniform families, the last thing I needed to uh, to have the definition of uniformity, so the size of the vector. Yes. Uh, let me try to get my head around uh, t equals one. So if t equals one, then uh, S sum intersecting says it's the number of entries that either one of them has S. No, it says that the number of uh, so I want. So S sum intersecting means that I have lots of vectors, any two of them has, a, has an index where the two entries sum up to at least S. It's not necessarily oh, that zero to S, or it can, it can be S minus one and okay. two and whatever, just okay. to sum up to at least S. Okay, so uniformity, well there are two ways. Either you can just, this is the rank that you add up the entries or you can take the number of non-zero entries support it's called and of course this is these are the same for for zero one vectors but yeah so again an example there's a vector of length 
or integer sequence of length 7, and the rank, if you add this up, 3 plus 1 plus 2, that's 6, but there are 3 uh, non-zero entries, so the support of size <coughs> 3. Okay, so generalization of the erdős Corrado theorem. Well, it's, uh, first of all, well, we need to have something in mind that what should be the extreme of family. What was, well, there for subsets, it was the star, so we had to fix a base element and then consider all the R subsets containing that particular element. So the question is that what could be the, uh, the equivalent uh, structure for, for, uh, for S intersection of, <coughs> of, uh, of integer sequences or for vectors? Well, again, you can fix one of the indices and say that, okay, if every vector has entry there at least S half, then S half plus S half is S, so the intersection will trivially be I mean, this intersection uh, condition will trivially be satisfied. And the theorem is that, yes, this is it. At least if n is large enough, so if the length is, uh, of the vectors is long enough. Um, so the, well, actually, there are two cases. And on the top, you see that, yes, it's true. Because what's the size of the star? Well, okay, you say that we fix that this coordinate that we are interested in is the first one. There is, we have to have an entry at least S plus, uh, S half, so that's the blue part, Q minus S half plus one base, how we can get, so from S half to Q. Then we have to pick uh, the other, so this is about R support uniform families, so there are families of, of vectors, so we have to pick the all the other R minus one non-zero, so this, the elements of the support, so that's n minus 1 choose r minus 1, and there we have to pick some entry. For every index, there is q of them, so it's uh, q uh, choices, so it's q to the r minus 1. So the top row is exactly the size of the, uh, of the star, but on the bottom row, when s is odd, then we see something else, and yeah, so the difference is that s half is an integer if s is even, and it's, it's not an integer if s is odd. So what do we see there? So suppose that s is 9, then of course, OK, I can have all the, all the vectors that have a first entry at least 5. Can I add something? Yes, of course, I can add any vector that has a first entry 4, because 4 plus 5, that's also 9, so that's good. Can I add more of them? Uh, yes, if I add all the, or Lots of, lots of vectors that have a first entry 4, they all intersect every other vector, but they do not intersect each other. So I have to make sure that in the second entry, they must be at least 5. Or they are 4 in the first entry, 4 in the second entry, and at least 5 in the third entry. Or, and so on. And the last, so that one at the beginning of the formula is just for the vector that has 4, 4, 4, 4, and so on. So that's it. So it's uh, 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 yeah. And so the thing is that this is the truth. And yeah, here is just the f formal way how to write this. I don't know this telescopic star, or I don't know how to call that. So uh, for S odd, that's a little bit more complicated uh, uh, structure. But anyhow, so this is the truth if we can assume that n is large enough. Okay, some comments. Not too many. Uh, so first comment, um, yeah. So it, so I mean, what the, the theorem I put there uh, it, uh, it was was uh, uh, stated for our support uniform families, and how whatever I don't say anything about the proof. Uh, maybe just one sentence that it. So first, you need to prove that uh, the supports form a star, and for that, you use some stability here, Tommy and Arun. So I mean, if you don't care about how uh, how large your threshold will be for n, then you can use uh, just a lemma or whatever. Um, and then once you have that that the that the support should be stars uh, should be a star, then 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 you add some uh, extra effort. But it's very easy when s is even, and it's it's not that easy when s is odd. Anyhow, so then the proof can be adapted to the R rank case. And actually, there is a, one more remark about this: that um, uh, the erdős korridor theorem has lots of proofs. Probably most of you know lots of them, or several of them. And one of them, which is probably not the favorite proof of anyone, goes via the the shadow theorem of of Kruskal and Katona. 
<laughs> Sorry. Okay, then at least one person has. Anyhow, so the, the shadow theorem has uh, has an equivalent which works for, for in exactly in this setting. So for, for integer sequences, there are some appropriate definitions. And in the case when we are talking about rank uniform families and S is exactly Q plus one, that magically works, or that proof of, I think, originally by Bacon can be adapted to, to this setting. And so in that case, we don't need that n to be large. In that, case, in that very special case, we know the largest size of, of, inter, uh, of this S sum intersect, or Q plus 1 sum intersecting families uh, for any n. And final co uh, comment, you can, well, in the case when S is even, the T intersecting version is is also trivial, so you just take the union of s uh, of t star, or sorry, the what's that? The intersection of t stars, um, and but and there is a uh, this um, uh, an, um, a corresponding uh, uh, construction for for this telescopic t star, uh, and one can we can prove that uh, that uh, if n is large enough, then uh, we can determine the, the size of the largest T intersecting family. Okay, now this is the part that I will skip. So, for those of you who know what Bolobash's inequality, so the intersecting set pair systems, again, that's a problem that is defined by something, so some sets should be disjoint, some other sets should be intersecting, and they should have some size and so on, so that means that our definition, they have a corresponding Q problem. And um, there is a very nice, um, so and a very easy um, uh, construction which is uh, proved by Bolobash to be extreme for, uh, for this problem. And there is a, an, uh, an easy generalization of that construction. And we couldn't prove, actually, that that is optimal. But what we could prove is that, basically, that is optimal up to some uh, polynomial factor. So if you plug in the Q equals 1 case, so that is the set case, if you go back. And if you take the, so those of you who know uh, what Bolobashi's statement uh, says, it gives you the extremum to be 2k choose k, which is roughly, apart from a, a square root k factor and some constant time square root k uh, factor, it is 4 to the k. And here, if you if you take the four, uh, k as root, then it's, it gives you that. So unfortunately, for this generalized version, we could only get that. And the, the instead of a square root k term, there will be a, a, a polynomial, but the, the degree will, will, will grow with Q. But anyhow, so, th so this is what we get. But there's an open problem. So if anyone's interested, I could send a, a manuscript uh, to look at the proof. But of course, um, uh, maybe the best way is to, to, to approach that is to just to by brute force or, or just to think about it on, on our own because our um, approach could just uh, uh, <coughs> get this, this weaker upper bound. Okay, anyhow. So, in the remaining part of my talk, so let's talk about extremal graph theory. So what is this? Again, something that probably all of you have heard about. Uh, we have a fixed graph F, or maybe a fixed family of graphs script f, so several graphs, they are the forbidden graphs, and what we want is to have a graph with as many edges as possible without containing this forbidden graph f or any of the forbidden graphs in, in, in the family script f. And the question is that how many edges we can have if, of course, the number of vertices is given because, well, that grows with that. Okay, and the theorem of Erdős, Stone, and Shimonovich says uh, that if none of the forbidden graphs are bi bipartite, then actually the asymptotics is known because so. And the way how we know it is via the chromatic number. So we take the smallest chromatic number in the in the family of forbidden graphs, and then we put that. Um, so let it be chi of, of f, and then we just use that expression. Okay, and that gives it, and uh, uh, for, uh, for bipartite graphs, it's, for most of them, it's, uh, uh, it's still open. So even for 
for bipartite cycles, it's only known for cycle lengths 4, 6, and 10. Okay, so now you have to, we would like to define this Q version and some version of the, of the streamer graph theory problem. So first, what should be a Q graph? Uh, well, there are two ways how you can think of this. So graph and Q graph. So either you can say that the, this is the incidence matrix of a graph. What's an incidence matrix uh, of a graph? It's just that you have the edges and the vertices as, as rows. So edges for columns and vertices for rows. And in every edge, you have exactly t, uh, two ones. And all the, so if you are talking about simple graphs, then all the columns should be distinct. Now I want the same for Q graph, it's just that, is, so again, every uh, column should have exactly two non-zero entries, and all the columns should be different. And the entries should come from zero through Q. So, I don't know, um, you know here I can have a three and a four, and otherwise zero, and then of course I can have a, uh, four and the two same that's fine because they are different so they are dis di uh, different rows or uh, different columns okay so this is one way you, uh, you can look at it or you can say that this is a graph well, just a bunch of points and some of them are connected by an edge and some others are don't and for the Q graph what you can say that okay these are the supports and for every pair of a support, I should tell that what kind of weights are there with that particular support. So you can have, uh, so these are the non-zero entries. So that is, I, it's a q by q, uh, q by q square that I have here. And then I can say that, okay, this weight, which is, I don't know, three and two and, um, and two and four. So these are there. So you, the, the other way how you can think about it is this, that okay, you have the graph of the supports and every edge in the, in the possible supports, you just tell that okay, what kind of weights do you put there? So that means that if I take the complete uh, Q graph, I will have Q squared times n choose two choices or Q edges because this is the number of possible supports and for every pair as a support, I can put there Q squared by Okay, and so these are our objects, and the next thing and that I need to define is that when do I say that such a Q graph contains a copy of an ordinary graph, so a triangle, uh, I don't know, a four click or a, a seven cycle and things like that. And so what I would like to have is that, okay, I should have so uh, as many edges as the ordinary graph, such that the supports are isomorphic to the forbidden graph. And so just to relate to the first part of my talk, there should, so how there was about, uh, that was about intersection theorems. And so some of the edges intersect, some of the edges don't. Those for that don't, I don't care. They can be arbitrary, whatever the, um, the weights are. But for those, edges that intersect, there the weight should sum up to whatever I will define to be the sum threshold, because that, so I mean, so for, if I have a graph here, and then I would say that uh, so uh, these edges are intersecting, then the corresponding Q edges is not just that the, that the, um, uh, the support should be intersecting, but it should be intersecting in this S sum way. That is, that the weights here and here should add up to at least S. Okay, so here's an example. On the left, you see a four triangle because, well, the supports, they form a, four tri uh, a triangle. And at every vertex, the weights add up to actually exactly four. But I mean, all what I care is that they should add up add to at least four. So if I change so, uh, one of the weights to something larger, then of course it's still okay. On the other hand, this one is not a four triangle because in here I see a weight one and another one, so that's not enough. Okay, uh, just one quick remark here. Um, 
so what I want is that any pair of edges at any vertex should have this intersection property. So that would be probably also an interesting question, but a completely different thing. If I would ask that, okay, if I, if I have here a vertex of degree three, then maybe I could ask uh, or weaken my, uh, my condition so that the, the three dates in total should add up to my sum threshold. In some sense, that would be kind of like an opposite thing because uh, if I had that definition, then the small degree vertices would cause the problems because that means that uh, that having a copy of a graph would mean that in a small at a small degree vertex uh, all the um, weights should be large enough. On the other hand, with the definition that I would like to uh, stick to today, if uh, if I have a large degree vertex. That means that there, almost all the weights should be large because any pair should be intersecting. So that means that with the, uh, with the uh, exception of at most one, all of them should be large so that they sum up to something large. Okay, definition doesn't matter. And so the extremal number is going to be, so I'm given n, the number of vertices or the length of the, of the vectors I'm consider, I consider, the forbidden graph f, Q and S, and then the question is that how many Q edges can I have of length N such that in this, uh, <clears throat> in this sense of, of, of uh, containment of, a, of an ordinary graph, we do not have F as a subgraph. And all the, the theorems I'm going to talk about are for the special case when S equals exactly Q plus one. So just one larger than the uh, largest possible entry. Okay. So there is a very trivial construction. You take your favorite largest F3 graph, and because if if you on, if you allow supports only from there, then of course you won't create any uh, any Q version of this of this graph. So you can allow whatever uh, weights you want to. So this gives you this <coughs> inequality. And, uh, well, this is hardly ever sharp, but of course, for matchings it is, because for matchings there are no intersecting edges, so well, this intersection condition is, is void. But for others, there will be hardly any graphs for which this inequality is sharp. Okay, so here's a construction, which I don't let you read for long, because it's rather I would do this. So this is this version of, of my definition. So what I will tell you that, okay, Anything can be a support, and what kind of weights I do put there? And I put there everything that is below the diagonal of this q by q square, so that is, I put there all the possible weights where the two entries sum up to at most q, strictly, strictly smaller than uh, to q plus one. And on the diagonal, I add some of them, I add those where the weight is such that the larger index gets the larger weight, strictly larger weight. So if Q is even, then it's exactly half of the possible weights. If Q is odd, then I don't take the middle one, but otherwise roughly the half. And the claim is that this one doesn't contain any cycles. Why? Well, what's a cycle? In our sense, if I have a cycle, then at every vertex, the two weights should add up to Q plus one. So it's L times Q plus, if the cycle length is L, then the, then the total, num, uh, total weight should be at least Q plus one uh, times L. Now, on the other hand, if I sum by edges, well, all I take there, all Q edges I take there have, um, have weights uh, total at most Q plus one. So I definitely cannot take anything that is below the diagonal because then I won't get my at least L times Q plus one. So if there is a cycle, then it only uses Q edges from the diagonal. But that's a problem. Why? Because, okay, so now I, so maybe this is the way how the cycle goes, but then I will have a trouble with the leftmost vertex, so the smallest one, because my definition was that I all, on the diagonal, I only put there Q edges where the larger one, a larger weight is put to the larger index. So if that means that in here, the smallest index vertex will 
in both of the at both of these q edges it gets a weight which is strictly smaller than q plus one half so it adds up to something strictly smaller than q plus one which is not good enough for me so this particular uh, uh, construction which contains roughly half of the uh, of the possible q edges it doesn't contain any cycle and okay so the Okay, so what, what are the things that do not contain cycles? They, uh, they are trees or forests, and actually for those, we could prove that it, uh, the extremal number, no matter what the tree is, no matter what Q is, we have something, so U, U sub Q of N is the, is the notation for this previous construction, so we could prove that it's, it's asymptotically, I mean, so the constant, it's a constant factor lower size, the, the, the extremal number. So, there is a, so we, we could prove that there is a jump whenever um, the concept, when we go from trees to graphs with, uh, with at least a cycle. And uh, if Q is 2, doesn't matter what the uh, uh, exact construction and the exact numbers are, but if Q is 2, then we were able to, de uh, to determine uh, the, the exact asymptotics for any kind, for any tree. And the only thing that you might want to remember that it depends on the radius and the diameter of the tree. Okay. Um, there seems to be a real even odd dichotomy even here. Um, the, yes, yeah. but this is for different reasons. It's rather that, um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a Turan type construction. And the question is that, well, I don't know if you have, um, uh, several uh, parts then in the largest part can you go so okay so the path so the longest path of the tree you are the parts and you go from here and then you go back yes. and the question is that are you allowed to have an edge within or not and that's what makes the difference in years at least for the construction and, yeah. okay um Another easy construction. So what happens if not just, okay, there's a cycle, but actually I have more edges than vertices. Then the claim is that I can take three quarters or roughly three quarters of the Q edges. If I take all the Q edges where at least one of the weights is strictly smaller than Q plus one half, that will be good. This is my claim. Why is that so? Because just as I uh, mentioned a couple of minutes ago, uh, with my definition at every vertex, there can be at most one edge that has a weight strictly smaller than q plus one half because if there is two then they don't intersect because they don't sum up to something at least q plus one so that means if i forget about these i forget about at most the number of vertices many edges so that was at most uh, n edges and if there were more than n edges then there remains something and that something that edge should be such that in the in this Q-graph, both of the entries should be something from here. So from uh, with at least Q plus one uh, half. And if I don't have those, then of course I don't have the copy. So that means again that if, okay, so there was something for trees, then there was my previous construction, then there are the unicyclic ones, and if I have one more edge, so if I have a component with, uh, with at least two cycles or with more edges than, than vertices, then there is again a jump. So let's see what's in between. Oops. So if we are in the bipartite case, then actually it's all good. We could prove that that universal tree is best possible asymptotically. So there is a, an error term. So it's exactly op the opposite as in the, uh, in the real graph case when the bipartite graphs are the hard ones. Here, bipartite is easy, or, or at least we could do that. And we don't know too much about the odd ones, or I mean odd cycles and whatever uh, trees or paths you want to hang from there. What we know that if you, it's a very small inductive proof, uh, uh, that if Q equals two, and you consider the triangle, then actually that trivial lower bound, so Q squared times the extremal number, which is in this case N squared over four by Montel theorem, so that is optimal. We don't know it even for larger values of Q, which is a shame, kind of, 
and we don't know anything about larger odd cycles, but also again we, we predict that this, this will be the very rare case when this trivial lower bound will, will, will be sharp. Okay, so that's unfortunately all what we know about uh, uh, odd cycles. So now, let me try to strengthen a little bit the, the construction that I just gave you before, so that we remember it was like that, okay, you, we, we take all the edges of which at least one of the entries is small that won't contain anything that has more edges than, uh, than, than vertices. So how did the proof go? Well, at every vertex there can be at most one edge uh, that has an, a weight there uh, strictly smaller than q plus one half. So let's consider f, the forbidden graph, and we say that the one removal is uh, a removal of edges that such that for every vertex we remove one edge that is adjacent to it. So, I don't know. Um, Here is my complete foregraph, and maybe I, I remove this edge because of this vertex. I remove this edge because of that vertex, and then this edge because of that vertex, and because of this vertex, I can remove well, either this or that. So there are two possibilities, either uh, a path of length 2 will remain or two independent edges will remain. So in general, for any graph F, you can take all these, one, all these possible one removals and there might be several possibilities whatever will remain. All what you know is that you remove at most n edges because you remove one edge for, at most one edge for every vertex. And then you can look at a uh, so whatever you have there, or what, uh, whatever is a possibility to, uh, to have at the end of this procedure, is called a one removal, and then you take the minimum of the chromatic number of over, over all these one removals. So in this case, uh, well, in both cases it's two, so either it doesn't matter whether it's the path of, of length two or the uh, two independent edges, but it, in some cases it can be, uh, I mean, some of the one removals might have chromatic number seven and the others or some of the others six and then you take the smaller or smallest possible one and that is what we call the one rhombus chromatic number and with the very same uh, proof as before if a, if a Q graph H contains an F an ordinary graph F then uh, this the support of the of the of the large q edges, so those where both entries are at least q plus one half, they should contain at least one of the possible one removals. Yeah, because if not, um, so again, so it's, it, the proof is, is just really the same. So uh, if we contain an f, then at every um, every vertex there can be at most one edge which has a corresponding weight which is smaller than q plus one half so remove those and all the others should be large and whatever is that whatever is all the others is a one removal so that means that if in particular i have a graph that avoids all these one removals and put there all the large possible weights then it will still not contain f that's good because we have the erdoston shimonovich and it says uh, you apply, you plug in the formulas, you do some algebra, and hopefully I didn't make any mistake, then this is what you get. And uh, on the other hand, if you just look at uh, the supports of the large edges, then clearly that cannot contain F, because if you have two large edges, then they, if there is an intersection uh, condition, they will satisfy it, because they are both, they are large because both entries are at least Q plus one half, so they are good, so that means you have an upper bound which is almost identical. The only difference is that here in the lower bound you have the robust chromatic number, and in here you have the original or the original chromatic number. So that, in particular, means that if the two chromatic numbers are the same, then you have the asymptotics. 
Uh, so my last two slides are coming. So yeah, if the two chromatic numbers are uh, the same, then we are done. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with random graphs, but so this is what it says that in some sense, well, maybe not the most natural sense, but in some sense, almost all graphs are, uh, have this property that the, 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 the two chromatic numbers are the same. So what do I do here? I take, so let's, let's agree that we want to consider uh, graphs with chromatic number R. So that, does that mean that there are R independent sets, R color classes? And the not very natural thing is that I consider that the, all, the, all the color classes have size M, which tends to infinity. And what I do that between any pair of vertices from two different parts, I connect them with an edge with probability P and do not connect them with probability 1 minus P. And then, of course, it will be a random graph. So every such subgraph of this complete R partite graph with all part sizes M uh, we'll have some probability, and the claim is that with, with pro if m tends to infinity, uh, then with probability tending to 1, this robust chromatic number will still be r if p is not very, very small, but doesn't matter. Okay, so this is one thing that in some sense for almost all uh, graphs, the previous uh, two easy corollaries give us the, the asymptotics. On the other hand, there is bad news. The bad news is this, so this, there is no probability here, so we considered complete three-partite graphs. It's not very hard to see, well, K111, that's the triangle that has a robust chromatic number one, but for Q equals two, we actually we could do, if you remember, that was this very strange thing when the trivial, absolutely trivial lower bound was sharp. If at least one of the, um, uh, part sizes are at least two, then the robust chromatic number of KRST depends on the smallest part size. If it's at most two, then it's two. If it's at least three, then it's three. So the lo last line is the trivial part, or at least by now. So this one follows from the, uh, from the two corollaries. When the uh, two chromatic numbers coincide, then there is nothing to prove. You just have to plug in whatever that formula gave, and actually that's uh, seven over two. This one was still hopeful because if you plug in to that formula, then the three is the case what you get if, if you get the lower bound. So if the, if the uh, robust chromatic number is two, then the lower bound gave exactly three. And we could prove that either if the smallest part uh, is size one or the smallest and the second smallest are of size two and maybe the third one is larger, then this is the truth. And this one is the annoying part because, okay, so the lower bound was three, the upper bound was seven over two, and we could get in so, that in some cases that if R is two, S is at least three, and T is of course at least three, then actually it's exactly in between. So uh, uh, halfway through the upper bound proof is an application of the regular lemma. It doesn't really matter. Uh, all what matters is that that it's not neither the lower bound nor the upper bound. So uh, those of you who are familiar with with uh, um, extremal graph theory problems, uh, not for graphs but for for some uh, related notions like ordered graphs, edge ordered, vertex ordered, oriented. Usually there is a corresponding chromatic number, so the edge ordered chromatic number and so on, and then they try to prove or try or even succeed to prove that actually that is the uh, right parameter. So here we define the one robust chromatic number and for some time we've thought that okay, maybe that is going to be the, the, the right parameter and the second line says that no, if there is a parameter then it's something different from what we did. Okay, so... I think that's it, and thank you for your attention, and I take any questions. For the, uh, for the Irish Stone Shimonovich, so you have the corollary, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, this slide. So is there a degenerate case here the way there is for bipartite graphs for the, because uh, I'm trying to parse it. So for. For uh, bipartite graphs, Erich Stone Shimonovich gives you essentially nothing useful. 
Yeah. Is there something similar here? Um, so the question is, what do you mean? So the, the real question is, so actually it can happen that the robust chromatic number is one for non-empty graphs. So for example, for the triangle and for any cycle and actually for any unicyclic graph, it is. So, so the, yeah, the so you can have a, a little bit, it, it's, it's tree, I guess components could be trees or unicycle. Or, or unicycle, exactly. Yeah. So that's the, the, the color classes. And, but also, so the thing is that you don't really have a very degenerate case in the sense uh, that if Q is at least two, and therefore Q plus one is at least three, then you can take on every normal edge, or so every support edge, you can take the weight one, one, and you won't have the copy because there are no intersections. Ah. So that means there are, so the extremal number is always quadratic. So it might happen that you get you don't get an additional part from here, but it's always going to be quadratic. You get the Q squared essentially, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean it's Q squared minus Q squared, but there is something um, anyhow. So you get something. So no absolutely degenerate case, but of course the, the, the robust chromatic number can can be actually um, so yeah, so it can be third of the original chromatic number and that's best possible. So for the complete graph, for example, you can take triangles, they can be the, uh, the color classes and then send over three. Is this uh, robust chromatic number studied for like other chromatic numbers or is it thing that you come up with? Uh, we haven't seen it yet, and we have some other results with 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 Joel Tamate and others, but we haven't written them up, so we haven't seen it anywhere else. Other questions? Oh, let's thank our speaker again. If you want to join us for dinner, uh, we'll be treating our uh, guests to Iowa barbecue again. If you'd like to, to join us uh, at Jethro's, uh, if you